Uh, welcome everybody, and uh, we have a, a really a wonderful opportunity to have uh, David McReynolds with us this evening. Uh, he uh, lives uh, in New York City and happens to be uh, in San Francisco uh, at this moment. Uh, we haven't had very many presidential candidates uh, coming to occupy or uh, meeting with us or wanting to talk with us. Uh, David McReynolds has run as a Socialist Party candidate both in 1980 and, and in 2000. Um, unfortunately, he didn't win. <laughs> but uh, he, David has been a uh, activist for civil rights, for labor rights, for peace and justice for over 60 years and been arrested many times. Um, and so he's, he's paid the price and he's uh, earned the, uh, er, earned the uh, reputation of a man who practices what he preaches. And he's, uh, as you'll see, uh, very articulate on many of these issues. In the Occupy movement, I think many of us are rejecting capitalism as a, uh, any kind of a sensible solution to the problems facing our country and the world. And so part of what the Occupy Forum has been doing is looking at what are the alternatives. And uh, we heard from Jerry Mander on, on capitalism. We heard from uh, folks last week on anarchism. And David is going to talk about uh, socialism in its many forms an overview of the theory, history, and practice. And uh, there's nobody that I think is more qualified to talk about this in this country than David. He knows the socialism and the socialist party inside and out, and knows the uh, strengths and the weaknesses. And uh, hopefully, uh, after his presentation, we can have a good uh, conversation, uh, questions, and opportunity for all of us to get involved in the discussion. Welcome, David. Hi, can you hear me? Okay. I think I can begin with a very simple definition of what socialism is. I think almost all socialists would agree on the definition. The problem is on how you get from here to there. But the definition is pretty simple. It says there should be the social ownership of the basic means of production and the democratic control of the means of production. And I want to list a few names, a few books, if anybody here wants to do some further study on this. And I, I'm not a good academic. I don't have a single good book to tell you about, but several you may find of interest. One, of course, was the Karl Marx uh, Communist Manifesto, which is a very basic document, and I think still very much uh, of importance lays out some very basic uh, concepts. Uh, I just finished a book called To End All Wars by Adam Hochschild, which if you read it, you will find out that there was an enormously powerful socialist movement in Britain and in Germany uh, before the Russian Revolution. Many people think of socialism as something which began with the overthrow of the Tsarist regime in 1917. In fact, there is a very powerful socialist movement in Germany and in Britain and in France. And Adam Hochschild, in the course of discussing the First World War, uh, to end all wars, with the title of the book, goes into a lot of detail and it's worth getting hold of. If you want to know about American socialism, my recommendation is a book called The Bending Cross by Ray Ginger. And it's a book about the life and times of Eugene Victor Debs, who was the leader of the party I belong to. But I think almost all American radicals look to Eugene Victor Debs. He was a man who was sent to prison during World War I for opposing the war. He was a man who said in court when he was sentenced to prison, while there is a, uh, working, while there is a working class, I am of it. While there is a soul in prison, I am not free not the exact quote, I've lost track of it. With time and memory lapses, I lose some key quotes. There's another book which is not well known, but is the best single book I've ever read on the 
Russian Revolution was recommended to, uh, recommended to me by I.F. Stone, and it's called The Origins of Russian Communism by Nik Nikolai Berdyaev. And I can't spell that for you, but look up Origins of Russian Communism. Berdyaev was a Russian, uh, was actually, ironically, eventually a theologian. He was had to leave Russia, I think, in 1923. But he had been in the moderate group, the Menshevik wing of the revolution, and he wrote a very fascinating document on, on what led to the, to the rise of Russian communism. Uh, the last book which I would recommend if you want to encounter someone who you don't know about probably is Rosa Luxemburg's very slim volume called Letters from Prison. That's available from the A.J. Musley Memorial Institute which you can find online. And Rosa I, I bought that book thinking that back when I was in college in the early 50s, late 40s, I thought Rosa would have a, a book about socialist theory. She was in prison when she wrote it. I was trying to catch up on theory. I was reading Kautsky and Lenin and Marx and trying to Trotsky. And I thought it would be a political book, but it was a remarkable series of letters that Rosa wrote to the wife of Karl Liebknecht. Karl Liebknecht was also in prison at the time and she wrote letters to Carl's wife. And they're a very moving discussion, if you, uh, letters. If you want to see what I would call the heart and soul of someone who considered herself a revolutionary, violent, atheist, Jewish, Marxist, read letters from prison and you will encounter a remarkable little book which looks as if it was, reads as if it was written really by a Quaker. Uh, Quaker Meditation. It's a very interesting book. Um, I, I really, what I want to do, aside from mentioning three names that come to mind, if, if you think of socialism only in terms of American groups or in terms of the Russian Revolution, you should keep in mind people who, uh, whose names you will know, like George Bernard Shaw, uh, Bertrand Russell, uh, Oscar Wilde, who prior to the Russian Revolution had written extensively about what a socialist world might look like. Uh, there were other writers in this country, but uh, those who are English and I would point to them. What I want to do really is to ask for some questions as to what you think socialism is, and then I will try to get, let it go, if I can't handle this without... The exact the exact phrase from Karl Marx or from the manifesto is from each according to his ability to each according to his or her needs. Uh, that was modified as socialists and communists had to deal with reality to from each according to their ability to each according to their social contribution. So it did mean you weren't going to get paid very well if you didn't do any damn work. You had your... Yeah. I'll come back. Yeah, all right, you. Yeah. Well, my grandmother was a socialist. Well, I do socialist with a country. Well, my mother was a socialist. I my and my 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 Pardon, speak up. The socialism exists. It's here for anywhere no. that you know of. No, it doesn't. It's part and parcel of different, you know, like different parts of the economy. No, it doesn't. It's part and parcel of economy. It's part and parcel of economy. It's part and parcel of economy. Can people please come up or we can bring you the mic because nobody can hear the question. The question was, in this case, does socialism exist in any form today? Sure. Sure form. No, it doesn't. Uh, what you're dealing with 
If you look at it historically, did capitalism exist in any pure form in the year 1700? The answer is no, it didn't. It was a very slowly evolving series of values which displaced uh, what we had known, which was guild uh, society organized around guilds. And Europe didn't know what capitalism was. It, it emerged in the 16th and 17th centuries. It had a revolutionary impact on the West. Uh, Karl Marx put it very well in a, a line that almost sounds like a Buddhist line when he said, all that is solid melts into air. Because the nature of changing the means of production into a capitalist structure dissolved all of the old forms we had of, of guild socialism, not socialism, of guilds. In the Middle Ages, you, you didn't produce for the market. You produced what the guild had felt was a, the right price. You sold through a guild system. The concept of having a market was something that was very new and emerged very slowly. So in 1700, no, no, no pure capitalism. 2012, no, there isn't. The Soviet Union was a, a valiant experiment. Uh, we can have wrong discussions as to when it went wrong. Some of us who, who would take my position would feel it went wrong when the first election to the, to the first assembly after the revolution, when Lenin's troops broke up the elected assembly. Uh, others would say no, it was the Trump stuff when strikers were put down by, by the Red Army. Others would say no, it was later. But there's not any question by, I think, anyone that the Soviet Union had, had ceased to be a serious democratic framework long before it came to an end. There certainly have been major advances in the Nordic countries. If you want to compare our society to those of Sweden and Norway, Denmark, Holland, Iceland, uh, I think they have it all over us. But are they socialist? No, they are not pure socialists. They are social democratic. Uh, they, they have managed to combine relatively great freedom uh, with, with very real degrees of, of economic equality. You don't have an extremely rich class in Sweden or Norway or Finland. And you have decent medical care and education. But no, they're not pure socialists. Cuba, which is a fascinating country, I've only been there once, uh, certainly has made enormous advances after the time that Fidel Castro took over, uh, including the fact that they now have almost universal literacy. The Cubans, after the revolution, took uh, teams of, of the teachers who went out uh, to the countryside to teach literally old people and young people how to read and write in Spanish. And so when we talk about Cuba, uh, it's easy to forget that any violent revolution, and it certainly was a violent revolution, has, has aspects to it that are not so good. If you look at the American Revolution, which was more important than we often give it credit for. Because I would note that the American Revolution was the first time in Western history when the idea of a royal rulership or monarchy was destroyed. The idea that power rose from the people, not from the king, was a revolutionary concept, and that's what the American Revolution was about. But Jesus Christ, how imperfect it was. No women could vote. Only men who had property could vote. We had the institution of slavery in half the country. And if you look back at that, that revolution, it was real enough in some ways. But oh boy, was it, was it only partial and incomplete. And we spent the last 200 years trying to struggle to get even the most basic human rights for women, for blacks, for Hispanics, and more recently for gays and lesbians. So, when we look at a revolution, you shouldn't expect it to suddenly provide enormously democratic, perfect systems. Cuba went through a nasty period early in its, uh, after the revolution, when homosexuals were repressed. And being homosexual, that was, you know, of, of concern to me. And there were camps in Cuba for homosexuals. That has changed. But, so the revolution goes through a process of change. But is there a free press in Cuba today? No, there's not. So, there's no country and I haven't even touched on China, which ironically has moved from the Maoist period into what is now clearly Chinese capitalism, and much the same is true of Vietnam. No, we don't have any example of pure socialism.
Yeah, could you say something about Michael Harrington and also uh, what's the difference between a Marxist and a socialist? There's no difference at all between a Marxist and a socialist. Uh, not all socialists are Marxists, but all Marxists are socialists. Uh, I'm sort of a Marxist, but I've never read the four volumes of Das Kapital. And I'm not sure I understand the labor theory of value. Uh, but I do understand and believe what Marx taught, that the culture we have is what creates, is, is based on the economic situation. That who we are, each of us personally, is determined by the accident of birth. If you're a woman and the year is 1920, that's a very different kind of life for you than if you're a man in 1920. If you're gay in 1940, that's a hell of a different life for you than if you're gay in 2012. If you're black, I mean, you get the point. The society around you shapes and molds the personality you have. And that concept of the material environment shaping the culture and the personality is profoundly Marxist. Uh, and I want to add one word. I see you out, out just a second. Whatever one thinks of the people who came after Marx, and I disagree, again, without trying to go into it, with all due respect for Lenin and Trotsky, I do not agree with the concept of a vanguard party. I do not believe in democratic centralism. But if you go back to the original Marx, he was profoundly democratic. His goal was the liberation of all, and the liberation of the working class to control not just the means of production, but to, to control the kind of society we had. Marx is the one, and other socialists as well, who pointed out that throughout all history, those who had control of the means of production ran the society and ruled from the top down, from the pharaoh to the kings, all of them. The socialist concept is that all of us should have a voice in how society is organized. And it needs to be based on the universal suffrage of the people below. There should not be a small group, the 1%, which makes those decisions. Michael Harrington. I'm sorry, Michael Harrington. Yes, I knew Michael very well. Uh, I think his books, which I have not read, I read one of his books, Fragments of the Century, but he wrote another book on socialism, which I think probably is a very good book. Michael and I parted company over the Vietnam War, which he supported up until 1972. So there was a, some hard feelings about that, a debate in the village voice between Michael and myself at that time. Um, that's, that's another discussion, because Michael did his best, and I think what he wrote is important. And he was a good voice for democratic socialism. We just disagreed at a certain point about U.S. foreign policy. I'll catch you, but just let me get down here. Uh, well, I want to point out several things. Yeah, yeah. You want to come up here? Yeah, come on up. I think it's a good one. Uh, I think, uh, oh, my goodness. Uh, I think, uh, Okay. Well, uh, when you mention all those books, I think it might be important to let people know that here in the West Coast, the place that has most documentation on socialist literature is the Needle Proctor Library in uh, Oakland, which is um, fantastic because there, there was the Casa de Cuba. There are many different socialist groups, Marxist groups there. And uh, I, I think it is an important reference. And also, they periodically do studies, collective studies of the capital by Marx. And as for pure socialism, I think that this is a bit redundant because, I mean, does pure capitalism exist? Uh, uh, these are historical movements, and they are in a context. And I think, you know, okay, you, you can talk about the split between anarchism and socialism, the split between socialism and communism, the communism and Trotskyism, etc. But I think we have to take into account when we say, was it totally democratic? That How was it possible that Russia was totally democratic with an experience of a thousand years of authoritarianism with the Tsar, which was terrible? Uh, so you cannot expect a miracle. Things work, but they, they are not miraculous. And, um, well, that, that's, I think, something important. And one thing that I think should be said 
because it usually isn't said, is that most of the efforts of the capitalist countries, the, the establishment of the capitalist countries, was to uh, finish off any sort of working class movement. And that's one of the reasons of the Second World War, I think perhaps the most important. So I mean, we cannot talk about, you know, only, and I know that communists have lots of defects, but I think it is important to know this, that many, many, many things have been distorted or hidden, and especially the persecution of progressive workers of all kinds that has been ongoing, continuous, uh, since before the Second World War. And another thing that I think it's important to say, because it is usually not said, is the organization of the Soviets, which usually here are portrayed as something dictatorial, etc., or in Cuba, a body very similar to the Soviets, which, which are neighborhood councils and work as neighborhood councils. And if people have not been able uh, to go inside Cuba, it is uh, because, I mean, such a tiny country and with so many enemies, it is obvious that Castro has the support of many people, many, and I've been in Cuba, because otherwise it, they would have finished him off. Uh, you know, they killed so many Latin American progressives. Yeah. No, I, I, you know, I just wanted to point out this because I think sometimes these things escape, and uh, that's okay. Thank you. I agree they escape, and one reason I suggested Berchayev's book, The Origins of Russian Communism, is because it goes into a good deal of that history, both of Lenin himself and of the nature of, of Russia. Uh, you had a question. For those of us unclear, I'm going to walk over there. Um, I'm wondering if you could give us a working definition, a very basic working definition of what is socialism. I, d I did that at the beginning. What? Socialism means that the people as a whole own the means of production. And with just a second, and that the people as a whole democratically control those. Now, the problem is how do you do that? It's also a problem as to what that means in 2012. If you go back to the time of Debs in this country, uh, the turn of the last century, then you had organized factories, and you could talk about the state taking over the factories and the workers' councils running the factories. But we don't have factories anymore. Uh, if you're going to seize the means of production, what are those? They often turn out to be uh, computer networks. They turn out to be the Internet. We no longer have simple factories where the workers can go in and take control and run it. One of, so I can't answer the question really beyond saying that the basic means of production, let's say that large corporations should be taken over uh, nationally and run by the people in the community. And that's a very complex question. And I'm not able to answer that here and now because well, I think many socialists don't understand is that the economics of 2012 is so complex that very, very few people, if anyone, really understands it. The economic collapse in 2008 was not expected by all of the people with the brains and the money who control our system and who lost, in many cases, lost their fortunes. The depression of 1929 was not seen by almost anyone on the eve of that depression. The collapse of Western Europe economy, which is haunting the world at the moment, was not seen by the people with the brains and the expertise. So I don't think, I don't think I know the answer, nor do I think there's some committee of socialists someplace that has the answer. I think we're going to have a long struggle to try to define how you transform this society where the handful of us here have no chance of taking over the port of whatever that building is behind us. Uh, well, it's, it's an enormously complex problem. In Cuba, it was done through a violent revolution, and there was a price paid for that. That is the establishment of a one-party state. There are still no organized dissent allowed in Cuba. There's no opposition party about it. I agree with the comrade who said there were problems in Cuba. I agree. But I'm pointing out 
that despite that, there are real limits to what happened. Uh, so I'm sorry if I disappoint you in the not having a clear vision. I don't. And I just, I'm more and more disturbed as I get older uh, at how baffled I am, not just by capitalism, but by how it works. And I think capitalism has failed totally. I mean, I don't, <laughs> Jesus Christ, you look at 2008, and what you're watching is a total failure of an economic system to function rationally. And that's not the first time. You can go back to the 1929 collapse. And we, we really cannot afford those collapses. Enormous hardship is brought to millions of people. So it's time to stop saying, and I have one more comment. Someone else, had, several had questions, but I have a, a comment. The idea that we have free enterprise is nonsense. Uh, we do not. We have not had free enterprise since sometime in the 1910 or 1920. No one today, and free enterprise means that anyone can enter the market. No one today can enter the, the car market. There's not one of you here nor any combination of you here that can start a car firm to make cars. No one is going to challenge General Motors uh, and Chrysler. Not possible. The amount of money required is too, too vast. If you look at the daily newspapers here in San Francisco or New York, you'll find that when I went to New York in 1956, we had seven or eight or nine daily newspapers. Today we have three. And no one has the money to start a new newspaper. The idea that there's a free and open market for capitalism is nonsense. That has not existed since, since 1920 or so. So we have a quasi-monopolistic system, we have a system which can set the prices on things. There's, for example, if you think about this and look at the TV ads that you're getting, they don't compete on the basis of the fact that their product is cheaper than someone else. They compete on the basis their product is sexier than someone else. And that's an admission that, in fact, is not that much difference between those two products. Stuff is advertised not on the basis of how well it would clean your dishes, but on how gentle it is to your hands or how nice the advertisement looks. That's not free enterprise. Free enterprise would mean a steady, heavy competition for the lowest price possible. We don't have that. And I get very impatient with my libertarian friends, and otherwise I adore, because they're right about foreign policy and they're good defenders of civil liberties. I get very impatient when they talk about the free market. There hasn't been a damn free market for a long, long time. And that's one of our problems, is, is coming to terms not only with the failure of the system we live under, but the fact that it doesn't function as it once did. Now, you had a question. Okay. Um, I actually have two questions. Um, one is, can you differentiate democratic socialism from others as much as you can? And the other one is, um, when I was in Cuba, um, I was going to study the healthcare delivery system so we could set up clinics in Nicaragua. Uh, for the Sandinistas. And one of the things that we learned um, was that people who developed AIDS were put into sanatoriums, their sanitariums. What I don't know is how healthcare fits into socialism, if at all, if that was a coincidence of the way the revolution manifested in Cuba, or if that is a if healthcare delivery and the constructs are part of um, how socialism manifests generally. A word on the Cuban situation, because when the first AIDS broke out, they quarantined, quarantined the Cubans with AIDS. Uh, we were horrified at that, but I want to take you back in our own history to the time when if you had tuberculosis, you were quarantined in this country. My mother, who was a nurse when she was, before she got married, had a very close friend of hers who had come down with tuberculosis. I remember our going to, to visit in the sanitarium, but you couldn't leave the sanitarium. No one in the sanitarium could leave. The cure for tuberculosis at that time was to go to a sanitarium. That's what Cuba did. I'm not defending that. I'm trying to give us a, something to judge it by. The treatment of the AIDS patients has changed radically in Cuba. I think Cuba has moved in the right direction. AIDS patients are now in many cases allowed to go back home there are visits that are easier for the for the AIDS patients, and I think their treatment has been much improved. But more important, in terms of the problem, the contagion of AIDS was stopped, whereas in our country it has continued. We still have the spread of AIDS, and Cuba pretty much 
it, it stops it. Um, on the question of democratic socialism, the real difference is between are you going to change the society by seizing power, which is what happened in Cuba, it's what happened in Vietnam. And as a pacifist, someone who's been in Vietnam three times, twice during the war and once after the war, I want to say that I salute the Vietnamese people. Absolutely. I would not have chosen that method. Three million Vietnamese died using violence to liberate their country. But I'm always on the side of the oppressed, and I'm not going to say to the Vietnamese, oh, I'm sorry, you're shooting people, I can't support you. I've supported fully their struggle for independence. I just didn't agree with the method. But that method cost them three million people. Uh, so we have to look at that, and the result was a government which is run by the Communist Party of Cuba. It's not a democratic structure. And the same thing is true in the Soviet Union, and it flowed from Lenin's theory of revolution by coup d'etat. If you look at Russian history, you had two revolutions. The first one was an atheist. Everyone came out on the street, the temperance workers, the Christians, the, the old ladies auxiliary, the young ladies auxiliary, uh, everyone came out with banners in, on the streets of Moscow and Petrograd, uh, and the government fell. The government was our no. That was what we would now call the Egyptian, uh, the Times um, Square, yeah, where we saw the revolution. That's what happened in the Soviet Union, in Russia, in 1917. The second revolution was in October of 1917, when the Bolshevik party seized power. I'm not blaming them. You know, I understand, I'm sympathetic to Lenin and, and what he did, but there's no uh, such thing that the second policy. revolution was not voted on, it was imposed by the Bolshevik party. I also, I'm a democratic socialist, which means I don't believe in in, dem in democratic centralism, I don't believe in overthrowing the system by violence. But I do want to say in defense of what happened in Russia in 1917, that there was much more freedom than we really understand. There was a young person in Paris who was there working at the time of the revolution. He was an artist, a bohemian. And he decided to go back to Russia after the troubles had begun. They had broken up the Soviets. There was the, the, the end of the liberation of, of the freedom of Russia had begun to disintegrate. And his friends had a going away party for him, and they said, you know, we're very sorry about you going back to Russia because we've heard all these terrible things about the new secret police, etc. He said, no, don't be sorry for me because you are set here in Paris to talk about revolution. That's all you can do is talk about it. I'm going to go back to Russia where there is actually a revolution. Now, Probably he was killed in the purges ten years later, but the point I'm getting at is that there was, if you go back and look at, at movies produced in the Soviet Union in the early period, they were much better than anything Hollywood was producing, by far. Look at Soviet art, look at the music, look at uh, Shostakovich's first quartet. Go back and look, and what you're seeing is a society where the forces of liberation had actually occurred unhappily and sadly. With the rise of Stalin, you saw the end of that period. But I would not lightly dismiss how radical that event was. Now, I'm not sure I've answered your question, but democratic socialists believe in socialism through the ballot box <coughs> and through creating alternative institutions. Occupy is an alternative institution. It's transferring, transferring power from those who are established elites into the hands of the people who take part. And that's one of the aspects of a revolution, of a genuine revolution, is a transfer of power. The other aspect is some kind of electoral referendum so people can have a vote. That's what democratic socialism means to me. Yes. Hi, I'm Sarah. I've been a, an American communist for almost 30 years. And I will make this into a question. Um, my understanding is that capitalism is its own grave digger right now because it's automating itself out of existence. Because it's based on, it's an economic system based on the exploitation of wage labor 
various forms of slavery. Um, we're now in a pretty developed place where that is being broken. That's what we call an objective revolution. The means of production have been revolutionized. And society has to adapt. And we're either going to have some form of to each according to their need, etc., or we're going to have fascism. And they're moving in that direction. I believe this Occupy movement is a the first spontaneous organized response to this objective process. And I think anybody who's a Marxist or a socialist or communist needs to ground this in this, you know, we can, we can look back in the past and see the mistakes. I think we have a wonderful opportunity now to actually, because we have the abundance, if we get, if we break the stranglehold of the corporations who won't do anything unless they can make profit on it. And this is, you know, the spirit of this movement is the opposite. We see people taking care of each other and sharing and loving each other. So I'm, I think that that is the dawning of this new, of actually the, the promise the answer to the promise that people have been struggling for and making mistakes. And it's been a bloody process because we haven't had the material abundance that we need. And so I know that isn't a question, but I, I would like your response to, to this idea that, that the revolutionizing and the, and the actual ability to create bun abundance without so much slavery and without so much exploitation, if that gives you hope. If you see that as a reality and if that gives you hope, it certainly does me. I, we're in for a long struggle, though. I, cer I certainly agree with your last point, that we're in for a long struggle. The problems you pointed out are not new. They have been with us for about half a century. Automation began long ago, by 1950 or so, and with the cybernetics revolution. And I think one of the things, radicals in general, and not just socialists or communists, generally don't take account of, is what would Carl have said if he was here today? Because he was a man who was very inclined to look very carefully at the objective reality. Karl Marx and Frederick Engels did not deal in slogans. They dealt in hard reality. And their reality at that time was the emergence of the Industrial Revolution, and with it, the emergence of a, an industrial working class. And that was the first time, by the way, in history that workers were brought together in a factory system. And one of the problems that Marx pointed out was that if you bring workers together in factories, they're going to talk to each other. And if they talk to each other, they might decide to act together. And you had the birth of the labor movement. And that hadn't happened prior to, to Karl. So what would Karl do today? I don't know. I'm, I'm not a great intellectual. But I know he would have enough sense to look at the revolutions we had been through. The technological revolution which overwhelmed the world 50 years ago. And the cybernetics revolution which we're still going through today. I mean, I can't even use a goddamn cell phone. I've got one on me. I know how to make a phone call. But the rest of you, if you have cell phones, walk around all day talking to them. I have no idea how to do that. I don't know how to store names in the cell phone. I don't, it's a smartphone, too. I got it because I thought it would make me smarter. And it didn't have that effect. So, but you guys, the younger people, are living in a new world. And how are you going to deal with that? I don't know. And I wish that Carl was around to tell us, but he would, he would be as baffled as I am, to be honest with you. Carl and... and <laughs> yes, I think you're right. I think one of the things that's important for us, whatever we call ourselves, is not to be bound by those who said something yesterday. The importance of Marx to me is not that he was right on every issue, but that Karl Marx and Frederick Engels laid down a general outlook on how society changes. And he was not alone. There are other names that you don't even know of uh, who were in the socialist movement in Britain and Germany that, that were very important people trying to deal with this question. Uh, they didn't all have the same answers. 
And in the case of, of uh, Leonard and Trotsky, they, were, they grew up in a very repressive society. Leonard's brother had been hung uh, for opposing uh, the Tsar. So, you know, it was a different society, whereas in Britain it was possible for the Labour Party to actually develop. But then look at it, Tony Blair, what can I say? <laughs> I don't have the answer to your question. You guys have to figure out the answer. It's not going to be easy. And the answers are not to be found in what was written yesterday. Um, David, I was wondering if you could share with us uh, what were uh, what was the, the what were the issues that you were running on and speaking out on uh, when you ran for president? And would it be any different uh, if you're running today? We'd be happy to have you running. Uh, and second, it's a little different issue, but um, well, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts. I know you've been very active in the anti-war movement as well as the socialist movement. What is the connection between the tremendous inequality of wealth in this country and the, you know, the the, the, the capitalist society and our militarism and imperialism trying to run an empire around the world? And, and what, is, what is the meaning of that for the occupied? I'm not sure. <laughs> but to take the last question first, one of the interesting things about the Soviet Union and China, and I've already indicated I have some ideological problems with Marxism-Leninism. But one of the interesting things is that Russia did not launch a war against anyone after the end of World War II, with the exception of Afghanistan. And if you do examine foreign policy with an open mind, you will know there are special problems the Soviets had in regard to Afghanistan because of the number of uh, Muslims along the border with, with uh, Afghanistan. It was a mistake. They were stupid to have done it. Uh, they could just as easily have been American politicians. Their stupidity was so great. But, but aside from that, in a long history, the Soviet Union did not attack any other country. The Chinese made a bad mistake in attacking Vietnam in 1979 because Vietnam had gone into Cambodia. But, but, and they, went, they occupied Tibet, which is a separate topic I don't want to try to cope with because there are roots in that that go back 5,000 years. So I just want to not try to deal with Tibet. But China has not invaded Korea. China has, except for a very short border conflict in 1961, I think it was, hasn't invaded India. What you should look at is why the United States has invaded Vietnam, Cambodia, South Korea, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq. I mean, look at that and understand the role that oil played in American policy, that the interests of corporations played in, in, in foreign policy, and the fact that we, that we have a military which Eisenhower warned us, and he was not a socialist, so far as I know, Eisenhower was not a Marxist. At last report, he was a Republican, and as far as I know, he was a general in the Second World War. It was Eisenhower who warned about the power of the military-industrial complex, and the military complex is the strongest single force in this country today, economically and politically, and it's the one thing which neither candidate is addressing when they talk about cutting the deficit. And in economic terms, I know we do have to deal with the deficit, but the one thing which is off limits, and Romney says he's going to spend billions more on, on the military. We don't need a damn military. We have four boundaries, four borders where we're safe. We can't be invaded from the Pacific or from the Atlantic. We have a, we have a demilitarized border with Canada, a demilitarized border with Mexico. What the hell do we have 187 or 157 military bases around the world for? Why do we have troops there in, in Japan, in South Korea, in Germany? This is nuts. And the only people who will raise this, and, and David, I raised this in 1980, I raised it in 2000, was the fact that this country is militarized, Nobody is prepared to question the militarism. No one is prepared to argue that we need to disarm, and that means down to the, to the ground. It means the international, international uh, treaties to get rid of the nuclear weapons on all sides. We're talking today about the danger of Iran getting a nuclear weapon. My God, India has a nuclear weapon. Pakistan has a nuclear weapon. France has a nuclear weapon. North Korea has a nuclear weapon. Israel has nuclear weapons. Why are we suddenly concerned about Iran? 
We don't want any nuclear weapons, and in the case of Israel, it should start with a Middle East uh, non non nuclear treaty. But I think um, the issues I ran on, aside from the normal issues, the regular issues of, of a of a, of a uh, I forgot to answer the question on socialized medicine, by the way. I forgot that. Because that's crucial to any kind of socialist movement, is that all people should be give, given adequate education and adequate medical care. When I went to UCLA, when I went to UCLA, I didn't have to pay any tuition. That was 1949. Today, my God, you have to mortgage your life to go to a university. How did that happen? I know that, look, I'm a realist. Nothing is free. I know that someone has to pay for the, for the colleges. I know nothing is free. If you're a, a real radical, you don't say free medical care. You say medical care for all, and we're going to pay for it by taxes. It's not free. But the question is whether you believe in universal medical care for every person, regardless of their economic circumstances. That's a basic socialist concept. And it isn't just ours. I think many other groups who are not socialists agree with that. And we have to fight huge corporate organizations that are trying to sell us drugs we don't need. It, literally, I mean, you know, uh, they make small molecular changes in the composition of the drug. We have about six different antidepressant drugs on the market when one would do the job. I mean, this is an incredible, uh, what pisses me off, it really makes me angry, is to turn on the television and find that instead of my doctor telling me what I ought to take, there are commercials telling me what I ought to take. Do you feel depressed? Do you have a hard time waking up in the morning? Do you have a hard time going to sleep at night? Take this, take this. What? Yes. So I, I really think that we need to tackle. Pardon? Viagra. That's a great idea, Viagra, actually. It depends on how old you are and when you just give up hope. I think the funniest commercial is the one that says, if you have any serious side effects and you have an erection that lasts more than four hours, call your doctor. I know there are a lot of men who say, oh my God, is it possible an erection for four hours? Yes. Okay. Question? Yeah. <laughs> you and I go back for quite some time. We we're both members of YPSL, the young, uh, the young uh, People's Socialist League, in, uh, in the middle fifties. Middle fifties. Michael Harrington was the head of the YSL, which is the Young Socialist League, which was a youth group for the Shackmen. And we were going to join up. They were like a Leninist group. By, by, by the model, but he, uh, he called himself to me. And to my faith, he said, well, well, what we are is State Department Leninists, as they call them. And anyway, but I want to mention a figure. Because how I, how I think of you is with the War Resisters League, with that first group of uh, conscious objectors. At that time, we had to be a, be a, you had to put on religious grounds. You had to say that God would punish you if you went in the army. Is that right? But a whole new group came out of the Young People's Socialist League, said, we're not doing it, we're doing it on secular grounds, we're not going to go into the army. And there's one figure, I mean, what you represent to me is the idea of pacifist socialism. If you haven't mentioned that yet. It's socialism without violence. Socialism that we can do it if we're using peace, love, and understanding and fighting one another. And the figure I want to talk about, because I was in Minneapolis. He was my mentor, and I think he had a mentor role for, for you, too. His name, name was Milford Q. Sibley. Does that mean anything? I know it means a lot to you. Now he's pretty much forgotten, except a few old timers like ourself. But he put out, he came out of the Quaker, the secular Quaker called Hicksites, and he really put out the fact that we, do, we don't have to uh, go to war. We don't have to use armed struggle. That, uh, that the, to bring together Gandhi and socialism and the tradition of Debs is what we're talking about. The tradition of the Quakers, a long American tradition. Am I right? Well, why don't you talk a bit about that? Because it's, uh, you all know about it, there, I know about it. Uh, and she knows about it, and the uh, World Sisters League started uh, to really put forth that philosophy, what, in the early 60s, started before the Vietnam War, I think it used to be at hate. Yeah, yeah, World Sisters League. But that was, was that, uh, was that the Reverend, uh, the Reverend, uh, was Musty. Okay, well, Musty, but uh, by that time it was more a secular movement, uh, World Sisters League to me. So anyway, go, go with it, take that, will you, brother? Uh, War Resisters League was, was founded as a secular movement in 1923 
by the men who had been in prison during World War I, and by women who were the feminist leadership uh, and uh, were also, for most, most, most part, in the Socialist Party. And it was founded because those men and women did not feel at ease in the religious organization called the Fellowship of Reconciliation. They were atheists, anarchists, socialists, and they wanted a, an organization that was secular. And, and War Resistance League was founded in 1923 as part of an international uh, pacifist movement that was secular. Uh, I did indeed know Mulford Hugh Sibley. He was a great person. And I, and I certainly knew A.J. Musty because I worked under him. But I, 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 what I'm not really here today, I'll deal with the question of nonviolence, but I don't want to impose something that was not really on the program. I think, as a friend of mine told me years ago, an old Trotskyist who joined the Socialist Party, he said, David, when we use violence, and he was not a pacifist, he said, when we use violence and strikes, it's because we've lost ground to the, to the, uh, to the factory owners that when a strike is militant and non-violent is when we can win the strike. When it can be provoked into violence, he said, that's when we lose, lose the strike. And I think non-violence has a very important strategic role in making it possible, as Martin Luther King did in the South, and this is about all that I really want to say about non-violence at this point. Happy to give a five-hour lecture an another time. Martin Luther King, Jr., provided the people of Montgomery, Alabama, a way to challenge segregation, which was open to the most cowardly, to the oldest, the sickest person in Montgomery, Alabama. All they had to do was not ride the bus. It empowered every black person in Montgomery to not ride the bus. And in very short order, the bus company had to sue for terms of surrender, and we won a great victory. I didn't think that would happen. I was still in Los Angeles in 1955 when Martin Luther King Jr. began the Montgomery bus boycott. I thought he'd be dead in 24 hours, because I had passed through Montgomery on my way back from New York uh, by bus, and I passed through that city, and it was alive with anger. The tension was so real that I, the, the last place I would have thought you have a nonviolent movement and the police force was in the hands of the ruling class, and it was racist and willing to shoot on sight. And yet King was able to provide a way for every person. And my advice to, to you, and I take it for myself, I speak as a coward, afraid really terrified of going into a situation of danger. Build a movement that has room for people like me. If you build a room that has people, room only for the courageous, it'll be a very tiny movement. That's right. And you want to build a movement for the old, like me, the infirm, the sick. Let them have a role to play. The problem with violent movements is that they disenfranchise large numbers of people who are not young enough, not strong enough, not brave enough to take part. And that's, one, that's the reason I think one should not dismiss nonviolence as something for the Quakers. Uh, some of my best friends are Quakers. But, but that doesn't mean they're right on all the issues, and it doesn't mean that you have to be a Quaker. You can be an agnostic or an atheist and believe these things. Yes. Thank you. I give it my. This is sort of part of um, the baffling nature of how capitalism works in in 2012. Um, but I'm wondering about. Uh, it seems like something that happens a lot now is kind of arbitrage venue shopping among on a global level uh, so that kind of large companies and bosses can just say we're not having that conversation and set up shop where someplace where it, where it is so um, and I was wondering you mentioned automation is not new and uh, I don't know anything about this I wonder if there's anything that you know or have observed from when arbitrage has happened I assume arbitrage is not not totally new either, and maybe happened on a regional level or one country versus an adjacent country. Is there anything you have seen from those kinds of precedents that could maybe could help um, capital picking and choosing a from multiple countries or multiple regions 
based on uh, terms that are favorable to them? Okay, that's not new. It's just capitalist <laughs> work. <laughs> it's a very normal process. It's been going on for a long time. The answer to it, if you can do it, is to build a strong international trade union movement so that the workers in China are not prepared to work for starvation wages. We have lived, those of, us, those of you who are 20 or so, have lived through an interesting set of changes. At one time, the U.S. sent the jobs to Japan because the wages were lower in Japan. Then the Japanese workers organized back in the 1950s and the U.S. sent the jobs to South Korea. And the South Korean organized unions, we sent the jobs then to Cambodia, we sent them to Paraguay, to, to various other low-wage countries. Wherever, wherever the wage level was low enough and the workers could be trained, and with automation it's fairly easy to train people, that's what happened under capitalism. And it's not just the U.S. The Japanese started to ship stuff into South Korea. So that if you looked at the TV sets you were buying or the computers you were buying, some of them weren't made in Japan. None of them were made here, almost none of them. But they were stamped South Korea, Taiwan was a big place for people moving to Taiwan. Uh, and yes, that was just capitalism at work. The only defense, uh, aside from what really we don't want to do, which is our uh, tariffs, uh, if you want free trade, you need to build an international trade union movement that's strong enough uh, to fight to keep the jobs here and make it very expensive for capital to flow out to the other countries. That's all that you can do. Sorry. Yeah. I'll make this quick. Hugo Chavez of Venezuela will be, will be facing re-election. I think Venezuela is an important example of socialism because as a country it is home to the point of production of natural resources which are the base of the capitalist economy. So that's where the, this is the, the original ex extraction of the raw material, the, the market is going to force the, the, the price of the, the labor and the materials to be as low as it, as it possibly can. And of course, Hugo Chavez has survived coups, coup machinations uh, that the United States government has been knowledgeable and, and involved in, most certainly. Um, and it's uh, an example of where the, the socialist agenda is not implemented solely through the apparatus of election mechanisms of electing individuals to offices such as the parliament or, or whatnot, but uh, it relies on there being a cooperation between the federal government and also the various local councils which are formed in the various communities within Venezuela. So when the resources are uh, distributed, basically what you have is an interception of the, the wealth 